friends, it's a huge pleasure to be here with Stand Up For Labour because this bunch of mainly young people, Arthur's not here so I can tell jokes <laughs> against Arthur, he's my age, and, uh, or even older, but better preserved. I can't tell you why he's better preserved, but he's better preserved. And unfortunately, his mother was taken ill today, and so he's had to go back from uh, Nottingham and can't be with us tonight, which makes me by far the oldest people <laughs> person on the stage tonight. And uh, that gives me a certain sagacity, a certain wisdom, a certain ability to speak about the past. None of which I'm going to do, <laughs> except to tell you that I can't be in a club like this, which bears a very, very close resemblance to the Merthyr Tidville Labour Club of the 1960s, yeah, yeah. and makes me echo right back through all those years, nearly 50 years, to a Saturday when the then Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Roy Jenkins, from Abersachan, and you could always guess that he was from Abersachan, from his broad Welsh accent, <laughs> he came to speak to a Labour Party rally. And I, being, a, I suppose, a bit of a rising star in South Wales at the time, before I became a Member of Parliament, and my star started to wane immediately, <laughs> but I, I was asked, by the Secretary of the Welsh Labour Party to go along and uh, get the audience excited, rouse them in preparation for Roy, who would de-rouse them. <laughs> and consequently on the Saturday morning we had this marvellous rally, absolutely terrific rally in, uh, in Merthyr Tidville, in memory of Dick Penderin, the revolutionary who was executed uh, in 1838 for his part in the Merthyr riots. The Tories used to take things even more seriously in those days. <laughs> and uh, we had this rally in memory of Dick. And after the rally, which was hugely successful, the executive committee of the Merthyr Tidville Constituency Labour Party had booked a room in the Labour Club with caterers in order to have a formal lunch. So naturally, as one of the speakers, I went to the lunch, and we were there in a big square table in the hall in the Labour Club with the caterers, and I was sitting almost next to Roy Jenkins, and around came the young woman who was taking our orders, and because they were caterers, she had a nice white cap on and a nice white pinny and a black dress, and she had a notebook, and she said, uh, what would you like for starters, Mr. Jenkins? <laughs> and he said in that broad South Wales accent of his, do you have, do you have, do you have any asparagus tips? <laughs> she said, I beg your pardon? He <laughs> said, do you have, for starters, any asparagus tips? <laughs> Sometimes when I listen to Prince Charles, I think they must be related. <laughs> And she said, oh, I don't know, Mr. Jenkins, I'll, I'll go and ask the manager. So off she went. She came back from five minutes later. And she said, Mr. Jenkins, the manager said, we haven't got no asparagus tips. Will Benson and Edges do? <laughs> True story. True story. Now, George, George Orwell said, George Orwell said, Every joke is a small revolution. <laughs> and so tonight, you will see in Stand Up For Labour some marvellous young revolutionaries. Because they do tell jokes, and they don't just tell jokes. They tell jokes in favour of labour, in favour of trade unions, in favour of feminist march to progress, against racism, against cruelty, against division, which marks them out from quite a lot of other comedians, and they are revolutionaries. There's no doubt at all about that. They're an absolutely marvellous bunch. And they would be at any time, any place. But of course, being a pro-Labour comedian is a bit easier than it has been from time to time. Because you've got a Tory government 
actually write in the script for them. It, it, makes it, it makes it much easier. And I was, I was thinking that last week, I saw in a newspaper, and you might have seen the same photograph, a photograph of somebody recognizable as David Cameron, who from time to time is the Prime Minister, when he's, when he's not chillaxing, <laughs> and riding around Buckinghamshire with certain former editresses of certain newspapers, he chillaxes. Well, at least he chills, and George Osborne axes. <laughs> and the, and there was Cameron, and you, you might have seen this, with a phone in his hand. Now, in the olden days, back in the 60s, politicians used to have photographs, do you remember, with phones in their hands. At, at the election time, when you saw the candidate's address, everybody had a phone in their hand to show how modern they were, how connected they were, how dynamic they were. But everybody stopped using those, but not David Cameron. There he is with a phone in his hand. And what was he doing? in this photograph that he had tweeted. Yeah. He'd sent it out to the whole world. He was speaking on the telephone, as he told us in his tweet, to President Obama about the Ukraine. Now you can imagine Putin <laughs> in Moscow, in the Kremlin, and he takes a report. His ambassador phones him and says, <coughs> Mr. President, I've just seen the most horrendously terrifying image. What's that? I just saw a tweet of David Cameron phoning Barack Obama and talking about Ukraine. Oh my God! Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Is there no merciless edge that this man will not pursue using tweets against me? I might have invaded Ukraine. I might have taken over the Crimea. But I don't deserve this. And not only that, they've got that guy, that bald guy, that skinhead, that Yorkshireman, who can drink 16 pints. What an imagination. And, oh, they terrify. And that's before. They've got that man Pickles. They've got Eric Pickles. What if they hurl him at me? I'd never survive. This is a master stroke by the genius of propaganda. Gove. He's, he's thought this one up. Mind, I tell you what, you don't have to worry about Putin in the Crimea. He's here in Nottingham. Oh, yes. Yes, he, we, that's why we took an hour to get from the station. He's occupied Nottingham. Well, he's occupied Mansfield Road anyway. Because you can't get up it and you can't get down it. Because they're cunning Russian soldiers pretending to repair the road. And they brought Nottingham to a grinding halt. What they've done to Mansfield, God only knows. <laughs> and it's, it, I mean, it really is terrifying. And, it, and if, if, I'll tell you what, if it wasn't enough to scare Putin, and if it isn't enough to write a script for Stand Up For Labour, just have a look at the budget yesterday. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. There was George Osborne making claims and promises as false as the dye in his hair. <laughs> he might not like the Greeks, but he bloody well likes Grecian 2000. <laughs> and he's had a bit of a comb over. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This time last year, I saw him in the mirror this morning. There he was, walking around like Freya Tech, with a big, bald poncho at the top of his head. I don't think he designed it that way. But <laughs> something has happened in the last 12 months. <clears throat> to cover up this hole in the back of his head. Maybe that's what he means by economic growth. <laughs> because, by God, it's hard enough to find otherwise. I mean, he said yesterday, we have cut, we have cut the deficit by a third. 
What he didn't say was, in 2010, he stood at the dispatch box in the budget, and he said that by 2015, the time of the next election, he said, we will have got rid of the deficit. Well, he's within 108 billion pounds of doing that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not very good at, at darts, but at least I can hit the board. <laughs> and it means, I was adding up the figures, it means that in this period of Tory, Tory government, because I can't bring myself to say <coughs> Tory liberal government, not with N Nick Clegg there. If Nick Clegg is anything but a Tory, then I'm a Trotskyite infiltrator. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, Cameron's got trouble with them as well. Oh, yes, Tory Trotskyites. I mean, they don't go around going like this and talking in Scouse accents. No, 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 they talk like that. They talk like that. Some of them are so bloody posh, they can barely speak English. <laughs> and, and, I mean, they say off, but everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Off. And they say grass, but everybody knows it's grass. <laughs> and then there's that other word, which means bum. How do they say that? Well, they say that properly, actually. They say off. <laughs> but, I mean, there they are, all the toffs, and they can't count. Because they will have borrowed in this five years of Tory Tory government, they will have borrowed twice as much in five years as Labour did in 13 years. And that included the crisis of 2007 2008, which is by far the main basic cause for having any kind of deficit at all. But because before that, we had no recognizable deficit. In fact, it was the second smallest of all of the industrialized countries in the world. Also, when they took over, and were going to savagely reduce the deficit because otherwise we were in danger of becoming Greece in the North Sea without the sunshine. At least that's, that's what he told us. It was a fantasy in any case. But when he took over, it was a growth rate of 2.3%. Dream on at the moment. The deficit was going down, and employment was going down, employment was going up. Now it takes a complete genius of incompetence to reverse all that and to do it deliberately. If you do it accidentally, well, anybody can make a mistake, I said. <laughs> like God said when he invented the Tory party. Well, you can't, you can't get it right all the time. You can't get it right all the time. But they did it deliberately. There was the growth going on, starting to recover from the world's worst ever financial collapse. And there was the growth going on. And there was the deficit going down, and there was unemployment going down, and there was employment going up. And he comes along, and he said, now we're going to stop all that. Because if we keep on growing, and keep on getting jobs for people, and stay, keep on getting reduced unemployment, and a better balance of payments, then we won't be able to say that Labour caused the crisis. So consequently, we've got to stop all that. We've got to have cuts. We're going to have austerity. Now, I'll tell you a funny thing about austerity. Sometimes, in the lifetime of any country, any economy, you've got to tighten the belt. Tightening the belt is an act of necessary economic and financial management from <coughs> time to time. Tying a noose, ah, that's a bit terminal. And the choice has been between labor belt tightening and Tory noose tightening. Because what happens when you tighten the noose is expiry takes place. And that's why investment is down. Why growth has been the slowest over a period of four years of any time since the 1930s. It's why we've got a gigantic balance of payments deficit. 
It's why our national debt has kept on rising, despite the fact that they've kept on cutting. And it's why the deficit, the year-to-year -year borrowing, <clears throat> has been increasing whilst they've been making gigantic cuts. And what cuts they are. This man, who made a speech at the Tory party conference about those people going to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and looking up and see the bedroom curtains closed and knowing what it meant. The strivers versus the skivers. The reality is that 62% of the families affected by the benefit cuts are in work. It's just that their pay is so <coughs> appalling that they're entitled to claim housing benefit to try and keep a roof over their heads and they're entitled to get tax credits and some other benefits because their wages are so low. And they've been going down. On average, as the Office for Budget Responsibility said yesterday in its report, not referred to by the Chancellor in an hour-long speech, how he missed it, I don't know, <laughs> that on average, British wage earners are 1,600 pounds a year worse off now in 2014 than they were in 2010. That's a pretty savage way of cutting. And then they draw attention to the fact that they raised the minimum tax threshold to 10,500 pounds, which will mean the princely sum of 56 pounds a year to people who are paying, as we all do, the basic rate. 56 pounds a year. Now everybody knows that just over a quid a week doesn't begin to match the rising price of food, the rising price of energy, the rising price of transport, let alone kids' shoes, or luxuries like going on holiday for a week. It doesn't start. And that's why Ed Miliband has been absolutely right to introduce this phrase, the squeeze middle, because it really does describe the shape of Britain today. And that's a big middle, a very big middle. Because while all these cuts have been taking place, while the losses have been inflicted, while there's been refusal to control prices, especially of energy, while all that's been going on, the national minimum wage is worth £1,000 a year less now than it was in 2010. George Osborne even said in a fit of generosity and imagination, never to be repeated, back in January, the national minimum wage should be £7 an hour, princely sum. Yesterday he announced it was going up by 19p to £6.50 an hour. That's the national minimum wage. Is it any wonder that Ed Miliband and the labor movement, the trade unions, are calling for the replacement of the national minimum wage with a national living wage? Absolutely. That's what we should be getting for. Now let me tell you, when, and I say when, a labor government introduces that as to their eternal credit, 30-odd Labour councils up and down the country have already introduced the national, the living wage, which is about £1.50 outside London and about £3 inside London, higher than the national minimum wage an hour. When they do that, the warnings will come from the Tories and from the running dogs of the press who support them, anybody doubting that, should have read our free press this morning. Richard Cobden, 19th century economist, said, it is by the illusion of freedom that men are enchained. Apply that to the free British press, and you'll understand what a daily effort at hypnotism and myopia and amnesia takes place at the hands of the Daily Mail, the Sun, the Express, and much of the rest of them, trying to persuade people that the reality with which they live 
and the actuality that they see in their daily lives, in their homes, in their work, in their streets, isn't taking place. That all is well. All is getting better. But what they will do when that national <coughs> living wage is introduced is to say, it's going to cost millions of jobs. Because that's what they told me when I first produced the policy on the national minimum wage. When Tony Blair's government, to their credit, their great credit, introduced it, the result was more jobs. Why? Because people had a bit more money. And they spent a bit more money. And that bit more money created a lot more jobs. It's ABC. It's a basic principle known in economics as the multiplier. And another little economic principle that you all know about, even if you haven't got these particular words, is the propensity to consume. The marginal propensity to consume. It means the less you've got, the more you will spend of what you've got. So if you make 19 billion pounds worth of cuts in benefits for the disabled and the poor, and those who go to work but don't earn enough, what you're doing is sucking 19 billion pounds worth of guaranteed consumption out of the economy. And what you're actually doing then is creating more unemployment, which you were supposed to be fighting by making the cuts in the first place. This is Tory economics. It's Tory economics. And it's real economics on its head. Which is why I don't sympathize too much with today's comedians who are on our side, and thank God they are, because there's George and David and Michael and Eric and the rest of the rival comedian gang writing the script for them. All we need to do is get the truth through to people, and when they stop laughing, they will start voting. Now that, as the marvelous Glenis Wilmot reminded us, is what we're about over these coming months, up to the local and up to the European election. It is absolutely vital that you strain every sinew to ensure that we get out every possible Labour vote. For all the positive reasons, yes, that you want the endorsement of the decent working conditions which adopted and adapted by the last Labour government originated in the European Union. On maternity benefits, on guaranteed holidays with pay, on sick leave, on various kinds of health and safety protection. And so it goes on and on and on, which is why whatever else divides the Tory party over Europe, all of them, wet and dry, europhobe and europhile, right across from the left to the right of the party, one thing unites them, and that is their desire to renegotiate, as they say, renegotiate, which means get out of the social dimension of the single market. And by that means scrap all the obligations on the working week, on paid holidays, on maternity rights, on everything else that has emanated from trying to balance the realities of a single market with uniform, decent working conditions right across the European Union. Promulgated and supported not just by socialists and social democrats, but supported by Christian democrats from Germany, from France, from the Netherlands, from the Nordic countries. Why? Because they've recognized for decades that there cannot be anything but tension in the labor market. There cannot be anything but restlessness in the labor market if working people are not given real access to doing two things, sharing in decision making, the Germans have got a word for it, mitbestimmung, with agreement. And the French and others have got similar terms and similar practices, first thing, and secondly, 
that there have got to be guarantees against the exploitation of labor, which, apart from its evils, distorts their precious market. Now, the exception to that rule is the Tory party, and of course, the United Kingdom Independence Party, led by Farage, who in the European Parliament, because of his record of absenteeism, is called Monsieur Farage Le Mirage. <laughs> it isn't now you see him, now you don't. It's now you don't, and again you don't. <laughs> they just don't turn up. But they'll be there at the ballot box this time around, harvesting every gross, every grievance, every prejudice, every oversimplified platitude about immigration, about Europe, and about the National Health Service. Did you know that it is UKIP policy to totally privatize <clears throat> the NHS, not even make the pretense that Cameron has of reforming the NHS we love? No, UKIP wants to privatize it utterly. They want to abolish VAT. Look today at the figures in the wake of the budget. 111 billion quid, that would look straight off. And they haven't said how they're going to collect it. Maybe by the restoration of execution for capital crimes, <laughs> but doing it in Wembley Stadium and charging a fee for entry. Perhaps they're going to raise it, the money that way. But you know, as that young man said, <coughs> that he joined the Labour, the Labour Party to fight UKIP. It's a pretty good reason for doing it, because they are kind of mobilized prejudice and bigotry really does jeopardize our country and jeopardize youngsters' future. That's why they've got to be beaten, and yeah, beaten yeah. soundly and solidly. Yeah. Yeah. For those people who will tell you, I can't be bothered. Oh, I can't be us. I can't be bothered. Oh, they're all the same. What's the point of politics? It wouldn't be a bad thing if we had printed on the back of our party card, not just the commitment to democratic socialism from the new clause for which is there, so that the word socialism appears in the Labour Party constitution for the first time in our history, which is why I was very much in favor of the change and actually drafted the new clause for. <laughs> but what I'd like alongside it is this from Jack London, probably the greatest socialist novelist and a wonderfully courageous battler for human rights and the advancement of working people. Back at the beginning of the last century, Jack London wrote the non-political animal, because they had such people then, you know. The non-political animal, he said, has no parents, requires no warmth, feels no heat and no cold, never seeks succor or company or friendship, needs no tuition or instruction requires no employment. The non-political animal, he said, requires no support of any description from any other being or institution. And when the non-political animal dies, he will bury himself. <laughs> it's all politics, isn't it? Every breath you take, increasingly dirty air that you breathe in as our world is jeopardized. There is no escape from it. And the reality is, you must tell people, that if they don't engage in politics and use their democratic right to vote, hard fought for, died for by previous generations, searched for by millions throughout our world today, yearned for, in so many countries, if they don't use the rights 
that have been fought for and won for them, they can be absolutely certain that the people who want to abuse them, the people who want to exploit them, the people who want to mock them, the people who want to tax them, the people who want to oppress them, the people who want to cut their National Health Service and take away their treasured essential benefits, the people who will hold their disabled members of family in contempt, the people who will neglect the future of their children, the people who will corrode the present of their elderly. They'll be voting. They'll be involved in politics. They'll be interested. <coughs> They'll be writing checks. They'll be financing the Tory party. <clears throat> so if they've got any sense of dignity, let alone fair play, any concern or compassion for those they love most, for the communities in which they live, they will take an interest in politics. Best to advance a cause of progress, but at very least to defend themselves against the horrors of exploitation. Remind them that there were always politics even before they had political rights. And the result of having politics without them having rights was the hideous history of centuries of oppression and exploitation. If they think those times could not come back in modern guise, with everybody blinded by pleasure, and 5% off bingo halls, and a penny off the pint, if they don't think that the cunning contrivances of Toryism are not permanently at work to see that they come off second best, then they are the idealists, and we are the very hard-nosed realists. So you remind them of those things from your own existence. You don't need any PhDs, you don't need any political science degrees, you just need to be an observant human being living in Britain in 2014 to see every day illustrations of precisely what I've been saying. If you do that, you will carry the message forward as you already do, but you do it with an extra vigor, an extra determination, an extra desire to get out extra votes as the only bastion that we have against the future which is riven with division and racism and prejudice, and bigotry and exploitation. I don't exaggerate. These forces are at work on a global scale and with endless power. Only democracy provides us with a shield and is a shield that we must use even as we use the sword of learning and courage to win the next general election. Sent on our way with glad heart and glad feet by a real victory at the election for the European Parliament this year. Thank you.